Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. Joining us today is Kevin Curry Knight. He teaches in East Carolina University's Department of Special Education, Foundations, and Research. He's also the host of Schooled Conversations About Education, a video series where he interviews practitioners and scholars about all things related to education. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Kevin. Oh, thank you, Aaron and Trevor. It's good to be here. So, I wanted to talk today about a theme in some of your recent writing and a talk that you gave that we'll put in the show notes, which is this odd thing about education that I think a lot of us probably don't notice until it's pointed out, which is that we're used to, especially now, we're used to living in a world of kind of constant change. The way we did things 10 years ago looks an awful lot different from the way we do things today. We've got new technology coming in all the time. But education, when we think about what school looks like, how we go about acquiring knowledge, looks roughly the same as it did hundreds or even thousands of years ago. Yeah. I would say hundreds of years ago. Not, I mean, thousands of years ago, the idea of kind of organized schooling was, um, you know, you think of uh, g- you know, getting together with smart people, it's apprenticeships, things like that. It was really, I mean, formal organized schooling, at least in the United States, um, you know, you could probably date towards, you know, around about eight, 1800 or something like that. So I, I would go about to 1800. Um, in Prussia, it existed longer than that. But uh, it's it's still a relatively new thing. And especially as you pointed out for how familiar it seems to us, it's still it's kind of shocking to think of how new uh, the system that we call education or school is. Yeah, absolutely. And we still think about these sort of one room schoolhouse uh, picturing the kind of prairie schoolhouse, uh, red and with a chimney, but a bunch of kids sitting in rows, looking up front at a teacher, and maybe they were writing on slate chalkboards at that time, but but still doing their lessons, writing things by hand, uh, reading things out of a book, listening to lectures, listening to lectures, and we still just don't, we still kind of think that that's the best way of educating children. So I guess. There's two questions which will be the kind of theme of the episode, which is uh, are we wrong to think that and and why can't we seem to change it? So I guess to go for the first one, uh, is, is that the best way of educating children? Yeah, the interesting thing is uh, so in my role here at East Carolina, um, I – I teach some classes that go over kind of learning theory and theories about what motivates people and stuff like that. And it's funny because, you know, when you delve into the literature, um, it would probably be a mistake to say that it is absolutely the wrong way, that it wouldn't work for anybody. Um, But the way we do schooling, you can take almost any feature of how we do schooling from um, the fact that we organize subjects by subjects or the fact that we have periods throughout the day, you know, first period English, second period math. Uh, You could take almost any any of those and you will find a good amount of literature saying that that probably isn't a good way to do it and you don't find a whole lot of literature that really supports these ideas. It's just – it's almost like the sense that I get in doing these this research is um, – these are more things that evolved for organizational reasons rather than pedagogical or you know good teaching practice reasons. Uh, it's really hard to find people who will say, uh, yes, the, the best teaching principle is you organize into 40-minute periods per day and do this for 40 minutes and then go down the hall and go into another room and do that for 40 minutes and then go down the hall and do this for 40 minutes. Uh, it seems like it's more of an organizational principle than, than a pedagogical principle. Idea. This research on alternatives that would work better, how universal is the condemnation of the existing system, not in terms of like consensus, but we often hear that different people learn in different ways. And so we, you know, there's visual learners and auditory learners and people who, you know, need to work through things themselves and people who can just listen to a lecture and get it. Um, And so when we Say that like this particular makeup of you know coming to school very early in the day and going through these forty minute periods on different subjects and sitting in the rows and looking at the teacher is it that that's just kind of uniformly bad um, in the same way that say bloodletting we know didn't really work for anyone mm, or right. is it more like there's we're just not realizing that there's segments of the population that have different needs? Yeah, I would be. Yeah, I'm always really cautious about saying that one particular method would not work. That I'm I'm very cautious about saying that any particular method is just uniformly bad. Um, 
because usually that's our tendency is to say, well, if that, you know, if that method's bad, what's the right way to do it? And I, the more I, I think about it, look at it and, and, uh, and whatnot, the more it really looks like it's that there may not be any best way that works for all or even a majority of the population. Now, you mentioned learning styles. It's funny, but that's actually uh, one of the areas of the literature where there actually is a fairly strong, uh, I don't want to say consensus because it depends on the literature you look at, um, but most of the people who've really done in-depth studies of the idea of learning styles find that learning styles don't actually exist. Um, it's tempting to think they do, especially if you're like an educational pluralist like I am. It's ten the tendency is to think they're kinesthetic learners, they're auditory learners, they're visual learners. But what people, uh, you know, so like psychologist Dan Willingham has uh, undergone a, a, a massive literature review of all this stuff on learning styles. And he's found that uh, while there are really aren't learning styles. There's no indication that there are some people who learn best in auditory and some who learn best in kinesthetics. Uh, but he does say there, there are such things as learning preferences. And what we've done is we've mistaken learning preferences and learning styles. It's a bit of a complicated discussion, so I won't sidetrack too much there. Uh, but there are such things as learning preferences. So it may not be that I, let's say, learn best when I learn auditorily, but it might be that I prefer to learn auditorily. And of course, if I prefer to learn auditorily, I'm going to be more engaged, which probably will mean that better learning outcomes will happen. Um, so I, I, I think very few people would disagree with the idea that at very least, there are learning preferences. Some people are going to make sense of certain things this way, and other people are going to make certain sense of things another way. And the problem is trying to think that there's one best way for learners to make sense of a thing. Let's go back and talk about some of the history then, uh, sorry, because we, we are always updating, especially the government's involvement, of course, uh, in trying to research learning preferences or, you know, they do research new ways of doing things. They may not be very good at changing, but let's talk a little bit about how we got to this point of schooling that we, we think is sort of the, the best way of doing it and, you know, we can't imagine a way of changing. How do we get to this? It, by age, uh, grouping students by age, subject matters, teachers standing in front of classrooms, seven o'clock to three o'clock or nine to five, uh, summer vacation, all these. How do we how do we get to that point? Sure. Well, I mean, all of those things are going to have a different story attached to them. So I'll give you a little bit of a truncated version. Um, and this is a very truncated version. So I'm going to kind of oversimplify a few things. Uh, OK, so. In the very early start, let's say, of, Amer of American schooling, which is what I'm kind of focusing on, um, schooling was kind of the responsibility of the family, of the community, and sometimes of the locality, depending on where you were. Uh, so some localities, especially in the Northeast, the New England states, there was always kind of an urge towards a public system of schooling. So they had pretty well-organized at least for the time, uh, were what were called common schools that were uh, somewhat tax supported, usually tuition subsidized them, but uh, it was really kind of a locality affair. Uh, the middle Atlantic states had usually something that looked more like a voucher system, believe it or not. Uh, so a state like Pennsylvania would often, uh, its districts would often say something like this. Uh, we know that there are certain poor kids in our district or certain or our area. Uh, so what we're going to do is the locality will keep track of how many poor kids there are and that district and we will allocate tax funds, usually through property taxes and things like that, towards those kids so that they can buy whatever education they can afford with the money and everyone else is kind of on their own. Uh, the southern states very rarely had any sort of formal education and it kind of makes sense if you think about how spread out the southern states were and how agricultural they were. Usually your education was um, family level. Uh, you might do an apprenticeship. You might go to what's called a dame school where someone opens up a school in their house and you might go there. Uh, basically, it was very, very unstandardized. Uh, the, every district had or every area had their own way of doing it. Uh, so enter the school reformer Horace Mann in Massachusetts. And Horace Mann was kind of a visionary for his time. Um, Horace Mann in the New England states and Massachusetts in particular saw his mission as the head of the sec of the Board of Education there. Um, he said, you know, our goal is going to be to standardize 
the system that works best because what we have in Massachusetts is this area does it this way and this area does it this way and this area does it another way. And it really, your education is going to depend on where you live and we want to make sure everyone gets the best education. So his idea was we want to, as a board of education, be like a clearinghouse for all of the ideas of how school runs. And we're going to figure out the best of those ideas. And when we do that, we're going to disperse that information to all the localities because his dream was to have a, a almost a uniform school system uh, and for really altruistic motives, right? He, you, you, you don't want a system where, uh, you know, poor kids are going to get a, a horrible education because their locality doesn't know how to do it and rich kids are going to get a great education because their locality is really well informed. Um, so he wanted to have this really more centralized, standardized system. So in, um, I think it was 1832, um, he went to uh, uh, Europe, and he looked at all sorts of European schools, Scottish, Irish, English, uh, Austrian, Prussian, um, German you know, schools. And he really, really liked the Prussian system. The Austrian system as well. Uh, they were very similar systems. So he wrote an essay. I, uh, if, if I recall right, it's his seventh annual report on education. He gave an annual report every year, and he, he wrote, you know, we have to try to institute this Prussian system. What he liked about the Prussian system was that it was very organized and it was very centralized. Uh, from what he saw, all the schools looked roughly similar. And they had a lot of the features that we have in schools today. So they had things like students were divided by age and or ability level, which usually was the same kind of thing. You know, 10-year-olds were, were together unless you had extraordinary ability, in which case you might go up a grade or whatever. Uh, they used letter grade kind of a system, which makes sense if you, if you want to progress up an ability level, Obviously, you need a graded system to do that, to figure out if you're above average, below average, whatever. Um, it was, I don't want to say it was completely teacher-centered. The Prussian system tried not to be teacher-centered, um, but it has a lot of the features that we have today. It was very centralized, very organized, uh, very academically based, subject divisions. What, and, do, you, what uh, do you mean I by teacher-centered, by the way? The, how is something teacher-centered? Yeah, so meaning uh, teacher-centered is kind of the idea that the teacher stands in front of the classroom and delivers a lecture. Okay. Uh, the Prussian system actually tried to be more interactive than that, at least as Horace Mann described it. So instead of the teacher giving a lecture and students would memorize things and give recitations, which is kind of how a lot of schooling worked, especially in the, the United States, the Prussian system really was uh, tried to be more, let's say, Socratic. So the teacher would ask a lot of questions to students and students would respond. And it was almost more of a conversational thing. So um, I think the Prussian system gets maybe a bad rap for being really authoritarian. And at least as Mann described, it. Maybe he had, you know, starry-eyed glasses on or something. Uh, he thought it was a lot less teacher-centered than a lot of the American schools. So the American schools at the time, for instance, were really, um, here's your lesson in the book that we're going to read, and you're going to memorize these, you know, grammar rules, and you're going to repeat them to me, and that's what the lessons would be like. So it's very, very dry. Uh, the Prussian schools, as he described them, were a lot less dry than that. But again, maybe he had kind of rose-colored glasses on. Um, okay, so so Horace Mann really advocated for this Prussian system, and we brought in kind of uh, a lot of the pieces of the Prussian system into Massachusetts and other reformers, Henry Barnard in, in Connecticut, some in the mid-Atlantic states and things like that, were also really uh, taken by the Prussian system and Mann's description of it. So they kind of imported the system also. Um, you know, we tried to centralize localities. We tried to make sure the schools in each locality were doing roughly the same kinds of things. Uh, so uh, I guess from there, we can go up to the early 1900s because they really set the stage. The, you know, the, the horse man and the like set the stage for what would happen in the early 1900s when we bring in what was you know, known as the progressive movement. Um, and the progressive movement really sought to standardize even further. Uh, in fact, one trend in particular called scientific management really swept uh, through education. Scientific management is kind of the idea uh, uh, created by Frederick Winslow Taylor, who's an industrialist. And he figured uh, as an industrialist, we need to figure out the one best way to do every job in our factory. So no longer is it going to be up to laborers to decide how to shovel and dig ditches and uh, create these products. We're going to figure out the one best way and we're going to have managers oversee laborers and laborers will do things in a very standardized, orderly fashion. And educators love this idea um, because they thought, oh, we can use this too. We can 
figure out the one best way to educate so that we can make best use of time, best use of resources, um, so that we don't have to trust individual teachers to figure out how to teach individual classes. If we can figure out the one best way, we can standardize this whole process. And that got into this sort of – did that include then the school day and uh, you know, subject matter and things like that? Yeah. Um, well, subject matter, I guess, came with um, – it's tough to say when we really started organizing into subject matter. I'm, I'm going to have to plead a little bit of ignorance on um, exactly where – I know in the Prussian model there were subject divisions. I don't know exactly what the subject divisions were. I think there was you know, divided into language, math, science. Um, penmanship I think was kind of a separate subject area, at least as Horace Mann describes it in his seventh uh, annual report. Well, it seems like – uh, like you, you have – maybe some of it could do with urbanization because you do have this – Spe the, the specialization is limited by the extent of the market. So you have the one-room schoolhouse might have been less subject matter oriented than it was the, the large yeah. urban place where – and also yeah. you couldn't group it, all the kids into age when you only had 25 right. kids in the town who were going to the school. That's right. I mean the one-room schoolhouse, not to glorify it because there were definitely um, – some big challenges with that, but you're right. I mean, when you had 10 to 15 kids coming to school, let's remember that the one-room schoolhouse in the early 1800s, even late 1700s, the, you know, education wasn't compulsory. You didn't need to send your kids. So a lot of families, in fact, didn't send their kids to the one-room schoolhouse. So you'd have 10 to 15 kids showing up, and often they would show up with whatever book they had from home. So sometimes that would be the Bible. Sometimes that would be whatever quote-unquote reader they could afford, and the teacher would just kind of uh, teach everyone individually because there was no option. So yeah, you're right. I mean, subject matter divisions and period divisions and age grouping really happened once schools started expanding, and that happened during Horace Mann's kind of period is when you saw schools start to really expand in size. So now the best way to do it is, well, if there's going to be one teacher for 20 kids, um, and you know another teacher for another 20 kids, you might as well divide kids by ability level because that's going to make the most sense for one teacher to teach 20 kids. And you might as well divide them by subject because that's going to make a lot of sense for one teacher to teach 20 kids a similar age grouping on the same subject. What is not divided by subject look like? Because like it, I, yeah. I'm trying to imagine what it would look like to say, OK, <laughs> we shouldn't keep math separate from English, you know, we're going to somehow blend those. Aaron's having a Statrix problem. No, you're, yes. there's an ep <laughs> uh, ep uh, episode and thing I'm writing called the Statrix. He can't imagine the other world. Well, no, so. I can. So I, this is what's what strikes me as interesting when you're describing these these characteristics of the traditional or the Prussian model is my wife. Uh, before we moved out to D.C. when we were living in Denver, my wife taught at two different private schools, private elementary schools. And in both of those, the model was the the kids were still grouped by age, but you had basically two years with the same – in the same grades. It was like first and second graders were together, sec, uh, third and fourth graders were together. Um, and then – so you got that that kind of abilities could be mixed and you, know, you, you moved along or you spent extra time in things. And then also it was um, – stuff was not broken into subjects. So she, as the teacher of 20 kids, would figure out what topic interested each kid. And these were all gifted kids and so they're often strange. Um, so sometimes it would yeah. be like – Wonderfully strange. Yes. He's not, he's not yes. saying a no, bad thing about but this. But it would be like you know, they'd be really obsessed about dinosaurs. Another kid would be really obsessed about hockey and another kid I remember was really obsessed with vomit. Um, and, <laughs> and, you, <laughs> and then you build a curriculum around that particular topic and so we're going to use hockey this with this kid to learn about math and history and social studies and science and then the next kid you know you have to build and so it's very work intensive for the teacher but it seems like it's right. uh, it's kind of addressing a lot of the concerns that you're so is that is that like how you would do it or is there some other you know just mixing subjects because again you get back to like the math and english seeming to mix counterintuitively yeah, well, the best way to think about this, because there's a whole bunch of different models. I mean, the cool thing about you know my study of different schools and what is there's just a whole bunch of different models. There's a whole bunch of different ways to do it. So if you want to collapse subjects, there's so many ways to do it. So the best way to think about it, um, Aaron and Trevor, is to imagine you know problems you face day to day or whatever. Um, how many problems neatly divide themselves into subjects? I mean, do you ever have a problem that you can solve? purely by doing math? Or do you ever have a problem that purely falls into the subject of social studies? Uh, it's, 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 it's fairly rare to find real-world problems that, that do that. Um, so 
Uh, I guess one model that comes to mind is uh, a uh, school uh, school system, I guess, a school model called High Tech High, which is located in California, San Diego. They are a completely project-based curriculum. And what they do is every semester, students are assigned in a group to work on one really big project. But the idea about the project is it traverses several different disciplines at one time. So at East Carolina, we just previewed a documentary film about High Tech High called Most Likely to Succeed. And one of the projects, I'll give you an example, is um, students work in groups and they have to put on a particular play that's from 5th century Greece. And they have to perform the play as authentically to 5th century Greece as possible. But they realize, of course, that 5th century Greece, females can't act. So what do the females do? Well, they have to take the same play and translate the play so that it would fit 21st century Pakistan. Now, think about how many subject areas and putting on this play would traverse. There's incredible numbers. Obviously, social studies is a big thing, right? You have to figure out what is it, yeah, what does it look like in fifth century Greece? You have to figure out art. Uh, you have to figure out how to do the set design. You have to figure out any math that would help you, you know, put together the set or put together, you know, stuff that that's involved with the play. You would have to figure out obviously languages. You would have to um, potentially even learn a certain amount of of Greek so that you could potentially read some original sources in Greek so that you can kind of check your understanding of the play against original sources. And what they find at this school um, is that when you design projects that are really big projects, you can design stuff that traverses a whole bunch of different uh, disciplines. So it's not like we're going to learn math today and then we're going to learn science tomorrow. It's, well, no, math and science are quite related. There's no reason you should be learning these things separately from each other. Uh, I'll give you another example. I just interviewed for my own show uh, a guy named Sam Levin who created a, uh, a school within a school called the Independent Project. And he was uh, – when he created this school, which is entirely student-run – by the way, um, he had a problem of uh, figuring out what the, the disciplinary categories should be that, that they learned from. So he created uh, four. There were social sciences, natural sciences, uh, there was arts, and there were languages. Well, where do you think math falls? So that's what I was actually just, I was just science? thinking that. It probably, I would say, this is a very philosophical question. I, natural science would be, would be my guess, yes. My parents, though, always told me math was a language. Yeah, well, yes, your parents, so, your parents uh, Aaron, would say Aaron that. Aaron for the win. Uh, it's Aaron, Aaron for the win here. Uh, he grouped it under languages because he uh, said if you think <laughs> about it, language, math is simply a set of symbols that are expressing ideas. So uh, it has a lot of – it's not only has relation to language, it is a language. And what he found, um, at least one of the things he found from doing this that was kind of unexpected, is he found that a lot of the students who – uh, had trouble with math or math phobia or I'm not a math person, once they were presented with math as a language, uh, a lot of them were more hospitable to it because we've all learned languages. I mean, even people who aren't math people, we know English, we know some language. So once you present it as a language, at least he found, uh, it made a whole lot more sense to a lot more people who math didn't really make sense to as much before. So, I mean, these are just examples of how arbitrary our subject divisions are. I mean, my favorite arbitrary subject division is reading. Why in the world would you separate reading from the subjects you're reading about? Because if you're reading, you're reading about something. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to say we're going to study reading and then second period we're going to read about art. Well, or, maybe, you know, maybe, uh, maybe at the beginning though when you're – when reading is a subject for first graders, they, they're reading about Dick and Jane. Uh, but I guess they could read about something that has more substance to it. Yeah, it's um, – and you know, that's – yeah, that's – and that's definitely a common argument for kind of separating out reading at the beginning. Um, but there are also, um, you know, uh, schools who really integrate those. Uh, you you read in other in other areas. So when you first learn to read, you're reading about something. So uh, going back to Aaron's earlier point of taking a curriculum that you're interested in, um, it it's, seems like it may be a whole lot more effective to uh, teach people to read through a particular subject that they're interested about that would require reading, rather than here's reading class where you read about Dick and Jane. And then you go to your other class where you learn, you know, content. Dick and Jane are really boring. That's true. They they are absolutely uh, absolutely boring. The Deridian reading of them can be pretty exciting. 
<laughs> uh, you see, you teach at a university, and so I'm curious, do these criticisms of subject grouping and other parts of the model apply less in a university setting where obviously things are broken up by subject, but these are highly, mm. highly specialized subjects in a way that they're not in elementary and middle and high school? Mm. Yeah, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I haven't really thought about that. I'm not really, sh I, I don't know if I can really answer that question terribly well. Um, I mean, t the only thing I can say is, is colleges and universities are pretty much bound by what they get from K-12. So if K-12 divides certain things a certain way, it's going to be really difficult for colleges and universities to take students from a K-12 system that divides it that way and now say, well, we're not going to divide it this way. We're going to divide it this way. So you still have, you know, math departments and um, English departments and political science departments. I mean, so you still definitely have these subject divisions. But... Yeah, if I mean, if, if if I were to guess, you're right. The material is more um, specialized, especially the further up the system you go. Um, you know, seniors are going to be more specialized than freshmen. So yeah, I mean, I, you know, so my courses, for instance, I teach future educators. I teach a course on the philosophy and history of education. I teach a course on learning theories, motivation theories, and assessment theories. It's hard to see how any of those courses line up with a, tradi a traditional subject division. It is interesting though when you think about how much just the general public, the K through 12 public schooling affects obviously the universities and, and a lot of the way that we, we live our lives and our movies, breakfast club, things like this. And it is, it's a little bit disenchanting if you really start thinking about as challenging the assumptions of how we have to do this and thinking about the possibilities that simply aren't going on or at least on a very broad scale for different types of schools and different types of ways of doing things. Why are we so stuck in our ways? What 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 is going on to make us just continue to use this Prussian model? I mean, I always tell students when I lecture, I say it's a pretty good bet if something hasn't changed in 130 years, despite airplanes and computers and everything else, that the government is running it. That's a, it's a general generally a good bet. So why are we so stuck in the stuck in the rut? Well, I there, I mean, there's there's probably several reasons that are all kind of um, I guess. Um, colliding together. I mean, one is kind of what you mentioned is that not only is it government that's in control of it, and of course they don't have any real uh, you know, price incentives or anything like that that would exist in a market to kind of change things. Um, but there's, I mean, there's some sort of cultural entrenchment as well. I mean, if you think about schooling, uh, everyone has been through this, some sort of schooling, and most of us have been through the schooling that we're talking about now with age divisions and subject divisions, stuff like that. So um, actually, historian David Tyek uh, and Larry Cuban have written a book um, on why schools don't change very much and why reform efforts meet with a lot of resistance. And one thing they said that I think is, is just very true is um, – once people get used to a certain type of schooling, um, it's really hard to think about what an alternative model would would even look like. It just becomes so obvious. Um, for instance, in my Foundations of American Education class, I tell students, we're going to just look at some of these features of schooling that I bet you probably haven't really paid that much attention to before. Most of us haven't. And students come out of that class saying, you know, I, it never really dawned on me to question the idea that we divide people by age. Why wouldn't we? Uh, but now it's kind of like, why... Why does that make sense? What's the rationale? So uh, another story about that is I have a friend, a teaching friend who was talking about how his district was uh, thinking about uh, not requiring Shakespeare, I think, the 11th grade year in English because they read Shakespeare in 10th and 11th grade. So the idea was there's a lot of other authors we could use. Why do Shakespeare twice in a row? And uh, he said when the district entertained this to parents and stuff like that, I mean, there was just a huge outcry. Like, why would you take away Shakespeare in 11th grade? And so the district and the teachers were asking, well, you know, what, what is your objection? And their objection was that's just not what you do in school. 11th grade, you just do Shakespeare. That's the way it is. Uh, I think we think – I think that's kind of what happens in education. It gets this kind of cultural lock-in. We just assume the way we did it is the way school looks. So any other way, uh, if they're perform efforts or whatever, we just kind of say, well, that's not what school looks like. And it's yeah. even bigger. It's You mentioned this with uh, ninth, uh, summer vacation. It could be bigger than just – the school effects. Like, why do we have summer vacation? I mean, the, the story yeah, sure, is always sure. that it's because of farming, but you say that's not true. No, it's actually not true. Um, it turns out that it's, and it, 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 it wouldn't make sense for it to be true either, because um, the great majority of people who went to school weren't on farms. But 
people just did summer vacation. Um, it just kind of swept through. And it, from what I've seen, it's actually because of air conditioning. It has more to do with the fact that summers were hot. Uh, th this was an age before air conditioning was was a thing. Um, so it made sense to break and adjourn in the summer and then come back. Um, but of course, now that's not a problem anymore. So why do we do it? Well, I don't know. I can't say for sure. But as best I can tell, it's again, it's well, school just looks this way. We just have off on summers. And if you think about it, a lot of people are kind of dependent on having off on summers as well. I mean, parents get used to it, first of all. But um, I mean, everything from, you know, uh, summer resort kind of places, they depend on people having summers. They have an economic interest in something like that. Um, any business or, or group who's dependent on students being off during the summer uh, would potentially object to that. But I, I mean, to my knowledge, not a lot of people have even thought about or, or very seriously about why would we have summers? Why wouldn't we just change the model? Although in a lot of other countries, it's not typical to have summers off. I, I, UK doesn't have summers off. Uh, um, uh, Australia, I, I'm pretty sure, doesn't have summers off. They, they, they'll go for a several week chunk and then they'll have a week or, or so off. And then they'll go for a several week chunk, have a, have a week or so off. Um, you know, summers are actually very ineffective. Um, a lot of the research says that um, at the end of the year, I mean, the idea is you you learn and you retain stuff throughout the summer, and then you come back and you pick up where you left off. Uh, but taking three months off a year, it turns out people do a lot of forgetting in those three months. Like, yeah, who who who'd figure, right? But um, you know, uh, people do a lot of forgetting. So one of the big complaints is people come in from summer break and uh, they forget half of what they know. Uh, whereas I don't think the same thing has been reported as a big issue in a country like Australia, where you go for a few weeks, you take a week off, you go for a few weeks, you take a week off. What if there's also a special risk adverseness in education um, from the so that the consumer of education or the customer, um, as, when there's some degree of choice, is the parent because the kid's not making decisions about what sort of education they get, and a special risk adverseness there that's not the same as like, oh, here's a new kind of phone service, I'll try it out, or you know, a different car, I'll try it out. Because with your kids, you know, I mean, I have three kids, and, and Kevin, you recently became a parent. Um, there's there's this like, I won't call it overwhelming panic that you're going to screw the kid up but you know there's there's a worry that you you might um, and so you you know an education is this thing it's like you get one shot at it it's not like oh we try out the new cable yeah. provider for a month and so this is my kid and there may be other things that are better but this is what I went through and I turned out okay and so I don't want to be that one who tries out the new model that's going to lead my kid to not know how to read. Um, and similarly with the summer vacation, it's like we kind of romanticize. Like I remember my summers and riding my bikes around with my friends and I wouldn't want to deprive my kid of that. And so the parents, like even if you can convince them this might be better, there's a high degree of risk averseness. I think that's right. I mean uh, the other thing to add to that is education is cumulative uh, and that obviously plays a big part. So. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, the research suggests that there's a, a window of opportunity where kids are really good at learning language, just just amazingly good at learning language. And the research very well supports that idea. Um, and yeah, so there's going to be a sense that if you don't get that schooling right in those first several years, well, you're going to have to play catch up later. But it's, it's true for anything. Uh, if you take a year of school and you go to this new school that doesn't seem to work out, um, you're going to be behind the curve, obviously, for whatever the rest of your educational experience is. Uh, the difficulty with that, though, is to assume that we have the best way figured out, that somehow, because the state is doing it, they won't make any sort of mistakes that are similar. The problem is if the state's involved in a centralized system where, um, you know, all public schools kind of look the same and do it kind of the same. If they make an error, uh, now it's not just one student who's going to be behind the curve, and that would be a shame. It's a lot of kids who are going to be behind the curve, and that would be a shame. And also, um, I they, guess the other part they can make errors and they can never go away, too. I mean, errors can persist in the state for a yeah, long time. Right. There's not, right. So, yeah, I mean, in a market system, theoretically, what's going to happen is um, a, a school that just produces really bizarre or bad results is, is going to be found out fairly quickly uh, and either go out of business or have a huge incentive to change the way they're doing it. Whereas I don't know if the state really feels that sort of pressing concern. I, I can't say they don't, but I don't see any reason 
that would motivate them in the same way, let's say, a private entity. But that, of course, is the is the question about what the critic of a more free market education uh, would say is for I mean that the, first of all they would say that we're mischaracterizing the state education system as sort of lacking in innovation and, and not trying to do these things. I mean they they sit around and they talk about new ways of doing things and they do change a little bit. They introduce computers and they introduce smart boards, uh, smart boards and things like this. They, they try. They, I mean they're, they take, they're definitely trying. They're they're trying, but their version of change is tinkering around the margins. Their version of change is so. I mean computers is a great example. You know the big push right now is bringing tablets and iPads. Sounds really innovative, right? But when you go into schools and you look at it, as a lot of my colleagues have, what do they find? Students are doing worksheets they're just doing on, my, on iPads. So it's not, you know, it's, they're not really, uh, they're, they're, they're doing the same stuff. They're just doing it with new technology. Um, whereas I would, I mean, I would have to imagine that there'd be a lot of, of, of you know, private companies or organizations, nonprofits who would feel a lot more free to actually really try to innovate more than that, uh, you know. So when the state does it, they they really tinker around the margins. Their innovations are not generally changing the nature of anything. It just changes the delivery model or whatever. Is the objection to this sort of state education or the free market education? I mean, it could be that they think that these kids, like is Aaron's question, a high desire to choose a safe option for their children and not something risky like a newfangled school that teaches finger painting for two hours in the morning and then has a sensory deprivation tank and lets them sleep for two hours in the afternoon, I mean, whatever, what, you know, the, and right. then that, that, as you said, it's cumulative. So that fails the kids. And so we have a big problem now that these kids are being failed by these free market schools. That could be one, one objection. But they also, they might think that there is a, a need, and this is something I didn't hear you mention in your, in your little history of of public education, that there is a need to standardize the curriculum in order to produce good citizens of a certain sort. And I don't mean something really goose-steppingly Nazi right here by saying producing good citizens. If you just ask, ask a person what do they think a, a good person in this society needs to know and everyone has a different answer to that question, music, math, reading five languages, you know, travel around the world, whatever. That's what makes good citizen environmental stewardship. All these things make good citizens. So they, they might want to control the curriculum in order to do that. And that's also part of the history of American education too, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And those are two objections that you do hear a lot. And they're, they're definitely objections worth taking seriously. So the first one is kind of, you know, the risk averseness. We, we know that this model, you know, works. It may not be great, but it's, it's safe and we don't want to take too many risks. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess usually my response to that is two things. First of all, that's presumptuous because you're assuming that the safe model actually really does work for people. Um, uh, and I wonder, I mean, it, you know, I've talked to enough kids and I was a kid for whom the system, uh, I think I survived in spite of the system. I, I don't think I survived because of the system. Um, you saw in my, in my uh, uh, policy, in my talk, I mean, I was, I was a very average student and in high school, I skipped a ton of school uh, because I hated it. But hold on, I now have two master's degrees and a PhD. Something's weird about, about that, that, that I almost dropped out, but I have a PhD and two master's degrees. And I know so many kids for whom, uh, you know, you go to school because you have to and you go through the hoops because you have to. Do you learn anything? Not really. Um, I always challenge people to think of how much – how much factual, explicit, like factual information do they know now that they know they learned in school? Like, can you attribute to school? You spent 12 plus years in school. How many things do you think you retained? Uh, so it assumes the system's working. And I, I just, uh, I'm not sure if the system's working. I, maybe people are in, surviving in spite of the system. Um, but I also say, you know, it, we don't know how much better we could be. We don't, you know, playing it safe is good in some ways. You want to avoid risk. Um, but also, it would be really nice to see if some of these ideas uh, are really good pedagogical principles. Um, and the only way we can do that is if we allow experimentation. And the only way we can allow experimentation is to allow the possibility of failure. Um, and maybe the system doesn't experiment because it's so big. Uh, big systems can't experiment that well. So if we disaggregate and we decentralize in a school choice kind of model, uh, you could take risks because if there is failure, it will be regrettable, but it will be contained and it might weed out 
fairly quickly, whereas in the state system, it won't. Um, but then you talk about the second objection being um, everyone needs to know a certain number of things in common, I guess, to be good citizens. This is an argument made uh, most famously by a guy named E.D. Hirsch, who put out a book several years ago with the title Making Americans, um, or The Making of Americans, I think it was. The, the idea that a society can only cohere if people have a certain amount of knowledge in common. And I guess my problem with that is – I can see that point that, you know, we all have to know a certain amount of stuff. But if we all really have to know a certain amount of stuff, um, does anyone need to tell us that we know that stuff? Like if I really need to know how to speak English uh, because I can't get by in society if I don't, do I need someone telling me from the school system, hey, you need to speak English? Probably not. I'll probably feel that in the community because it is a need. And if I don't feel that, the question is, is it actually a need? Um, but secondly, I mean, I think we overstate that case. If we think about what makes society work, some of it's because we share common things and some of it is because we don't share common things. Some of it is because I can rely on you know, other people to know other things than I do and they can learn things from me. You know, Think about the way a market works, for instance. It doesn't work because we all know common stuff. It works because we all know different stuff. So uh, I think we overstate exactly how much stuff we need to know in common. And certainly, I would say probably not 12 years worth. A couple of possible problems with using school choice or freeing up the system in order to experiment. Um, first, we do have school choice. It's not widespread and we still have this very large public school system that's very top down. But there are – alternatives out there. There are private schools. There are charter schools. There are other systems. There's homeschooling. But even in those, there are occasional ones that go really outside the box. But even those tend to stick pretty closely to the model that is in place in the public schools. They're not meaningfully different. And the other one is the way that competition works, like the failure. It seems like one of the issues with education is it takes a long time to figure out whether it's working or not. So, you know, I went like I went through 12 years of K-12 and um, more than four years of undergraduate study and then law school and arguably my education didn't pay off or didn't get to a point where we could say, well, was he educated well or not until I was mm. 30, you know, and so – I so think some of us are still wondering, so just saying. It's possible, but you know, we've we've at least <laughs> marginally moved into it. Um, but <clears throat> that's I mean, that's a long time to say like we, you know, here's a new model, let's try it out, but we won't actually know if it's working or not until these kids graduate and go out into the workforce and we can do long term studies of whether they're successful or not on different metrics. And so it's harder to for the especially the parents, the ones who are making these decisions to really judge. Yeah. Um so here's a thought on that, and I'm not sold on this thought, but I'm not sold against it because I definitely hear that criticism and I understand you know, the, the, the force of it. Um, I don't know, again, if we overplay exactly how long term you would, you would have to wait to figure out the results of education because I think if you were to ask parents – um, after a year is over of their child's schooling, can you tell if they've learned stuff or not? Uh, they probably won't say, I won't know that until they're 25. They'll probably be able to tell you, yes, even on a weekly, monthly basis, number one, I can tell whether my kid's miserable, I can tell whether my kid is bored to tears, or I can tell whether my kid's learning stuff. Like I can ask, what did you learn today? Tell me. And if he can say something, if he can tell me something, great. If he can't, not. Uh, but that doesn't solve the problem entirely because there are things that will show up later. Like uh, did you develop a, a, a critical uh, a capacity to think critically? That's something that you probably won't see until like kind of a long term. Or do you know how to be a good person? person, maybe. That's something that won't show up until long term. But there are short term metrics that you can certainly use. So I, I, I definitely feel that criticism, but I think we maybe overstate exactly how long term you have to wait to figure out the results of education. Because some are proximate and some are ultimate. It seems that we have a, a pretty big opportunity right now because the world has changed a fair amount in the last 15 years. Uh, people who are 15 years old now, for example, go on go on YouTube. You can learn pretty much anything that you want to learn on YouTube. Um, people are teaching themselves everything from 
uh, musical instruments to how to change their oil in their car and things in between. Of course, we have Khan Academy and and sure. open courses and and libertarianism dot libertari- guides and libertarianism dot org guides yeah, yeah. and this podcast. We have all these wonderful educational resources. And YouTube out there. being the second largest search engine. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, and we have a economy that is changing. People are starting to think about job skills and universities different and there's a lot more ability to you know we have people becoming youtube stars because they're teaching everyone how to knit there's just a lot of things changing do we have an opportunity because of this to actually start getting a widespread rethinking of what education is what its purposes are and to maybe start to break a little bit of this stranglehold that the Prussian model has on the system. You know, it's interesting because I've been thinking a lot about this, uh, going back to the criticism that we mentioned about uh, education teaches people kind of the same stuff. Like we have this idea that in school, if we don't teach you all the things you're going to need to know once you go into adulthood, that somehow it's going to be a catastrophe for for people. Like we have to teach every, every, you know, this important thing and this important thing and this important thing. I was thinking about like, okay, let me apply that to my own education and see if that was true for me. Um, so I grew up, I, I'm 39 now. I grew up in the age where computers and the internet kind of rose with me. Uh, you know, so in middle school, you know, some people had personal computers, but it was all MS-DOS and it was all, you know, the, the, the you know, word processor and there was no real internet or anything like that. In high school, internet started to kind of become something people heard about and, and whatnot, but it wasn't really a huge thing. And then in college, that's when the internet started blowing up. So here's some of the things I didn't learn when I was in school. I didn't learn what a web page was was. I didn't learn what a hyperlink was. I didn't learn what a Google search was or how to do one because Google didn't exist yet. I didn't learn how to make video calls. Uh, I didn't learn texting. I didn't learn any of that stuff. Uh, I learned how to type in high school because that was, you know, every people had PCs. And I guess my point is if school is the place where you learn stuff to prepare you for adulthood, then I must have been prepared pretty poorly because I didn't learn a lot of the stuff that I know now, web pages, websites, how to do searches, how to navigate online spaces. I learned that after schooling is over. And I think that's true for a lot of people. You learn stuff after school happens. And in fact, we forget a lot of the stuff from school. Uh, we know that people don't take with them the majority of stuff that they learn in school. So it's always seems to me a little bit foolish to think that we can plan, educational planners can know what people will need to know after they graduate high school. Because if you think about it, that's 12 years. We can't predict 12 years from now what people are going to be able to know. We can maybe have a rough idea that they'll be able to read. They'll need to read because reading will still be a thing. Uh, we can maybe think about the idea that they'll need math. That's questionable. We have devices that are really sophisticated at math. Uh, they'll need to know certain things. But I, I mean, it's just foolish to think that we can plan a 12-year curriculum. It, with any accuracy. You're going to have so many false positives, things that you learned in school that people were convinced you would need to know that all of a sudden you get out in the world you didn't need to know. And things like false negatives. I didn't learn anything about the internet. And all that I learned about the internet, I learned outside of school. So, so do we do we see this changing the culture? I mean, this idea, understanding of a lifelong learning then uh, for for changing how how we can reform schools possibly. Uh, can you clear? Can you clarify the, the question? I'm the, not sure. The question the, the about all these this increasing understanding of different ways of learning things, where you learn valuable skills, the speed of the world too. That uh, we have to learn how to program a new language. If you learn C plus plus in the 1990s, it may not be so useful anymore. So it, all this sort of understanding of the different opportunities, the different ways of learning, and the way the economy is changing. Are we? Can we? help will this help change the way people think about education well i, I don't know um and here's why uh we are so wedded right now to the idea that the evidence of learning is your ability to articulate that information on a test and the problem is that the stuff that i think we're talking about like you need to you really will need to know are what we might call soft skills. You need to learn how to collaborate. You need to learn how to think critically. You need to learn how to be a good person. You need to learn how to communicate well, stuff like that. Uh, my fear is that those are not the kinds of things you can demonstrate very easily on the kinds of tests 
that we're very wedded to in the public model. So tests that we're talking about, like the end of grade tests, let's say in North Carolina, or the high school assessments that, that I used to give as a teacher in Maryland, that focuses on like what I would call like um, articulatable knowledge, um, what Hayek might have called scientific knowledge, I guess, uh, stuff that you can articulate. Uh, if I ask you who was the president in the year 1955, that's articulable knowledge. You can articulate an answer to me. But if I ask you to tell, to demonstrate for me how well you are as a critical thinker, th I, there's really no test I can design for that. That's any kind of that um, that yields uh, that lends itself towards standardization. So I guess my answer is that the school system seems to be going more and more in the direction of standardization and and learning being something that is demonstrable on a test. And I'm not sure the kinds of skills that people really will need in the future, the kinds that would lead, you know, that maybe other schools could teach better than, than we do in, in um, school systems now. I'm not sure that kind of information or that kind of knowledge is the kind of stuff that's articulable for a test. So I, I guess I'm somewhat pessimistic about that because the school system really is going more towards that. You have to be able to demonstrate this on a test. Otherwise, it doesn't count as knowledge. And that limits the amount of innovation that you could potentially do, at least within the school matrix that we have now. If you've enjoyed listening to Free Thoughts this past year, I encourage you to check out Libertarianism.org's Facebook page, where you can vote on your favorite episode of 2016. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.